Hi, it's Greg Dalton. I'd like to hear your comments on the show, topics we should cover, and guest suggestions. You can reach me at greg at climateone.org. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. To avoid the worst effects of a climate catastrophe, we need to get off fossil fuels fast. But what does it take for clean technologies to reach mass market adoption? I would say that renewables have have passed the tipping point. I think that I think they are the dominant force in, in the power system today. If you look at all of the power capacity that's added each year, about two thirds of it is wind or solar. About 80% of it is as clean as renewables. That's good news for the power sector, but what can be done to help spur other clean solutions, like electric vehicles? I I think it's all about creating that policy environment where there's confidence for the automakers to invest. We saw Ford come forward with its $50 billion EV plan, which really just gives me a lot of confidence that we are going to see that mass market adoption in the U.S. in the next few years. No going back. EVs and clean tech tipping points. Up next on Climate One. In the tech world, there's a common belief that once a new device hits 5% market penetration, it rapidly goes from a niche to mass adoption. Think of smartphones, social media, or even the personal computer. Could the same be true of the green tech we need to prevent the most dire climate catastrophe? According to Bloomberg, the U.S. has just passed that critical 5% tipping point for new EV purchases. Norway, an oil-rich country, was first to hit that 5% mark in 2013 and today boasts a stunning 86% of new cars being fully electric. Now, California is driving the U.S. along a similar road away from gasoline and diesel. The state just passed a new law that will only allow emission-free vehicles to be sold by 2035. Washington, Massachusetts, Virginia, and other states are poised to follow. Even with that California law, How confident can we be that all new American cars will be running clean? Albert Chung is head of global analysis for Bloomberg NEF. I asked him about the Bloomberg Tipping Point story. Yeah, um, this is an article that um, uh, my colleague Tom Randall from Bloomberg News wrote um, using the data collected by my team in BNF. And he makes this assertion that once a market hits 5% EV sales, then that's the tipping point and everything's going to go from there and and you're going to see a huge scale up. And it's really interesting. So I I actually looked into the data myself just to see, you know, because it's our our data as well. Because you could argue, you know, the tipping point's 1% or it's 10% or whatever. So I looked at the UK because the UK is a big, it's a broad-based economy. It's not Norway because everybody talks about Norway all the time, but everyone goes, but not everywhere is Norway. And the UK is a big, broader-based economy and it didn't have such a huge tax break for EVs as Norway did. So what happened in the UK was um, it took about five years to get to 1% EV sales. That happened at the beginning of 2015. So Q1 2015, roughly five years after the start of EV sales. You can debate whether EV sales started in 08, 10, whatever. Roughly five years. It took about another five years to get to 5%. And that was the end of 2019. And actually, it never even got close to 5% until that point. Uh, Q4 2019, we got to 5%. One year after that, we were at 18%. And another year after that, we were at 33%. So if you just take a look at the UK, it was very, very clear, um, at least here where I live, that once you cross 5%, then suddenly everything changed and the, and the market took off. So then I looked back to Norway. So, okay, so what did Norway do after it hit 33%? Because there's not that many markets that have gone that far. So for Norway, after it hit 33%, which, which is where we are in the UK today, it only took them about four and four or five years to get to ninety percent. And um, you're talking about percentage of new car sales. Of new car sales, that's right. Okay. So what I hear there is, yeah, you know, five years to get to one percent, another five years to get to five percent, and then that you know those curves start to start to bend up. And then a person could also say, well, the UK is not the world. Uh, is, are there a special policy, you know, and how do you extrapolate from two European countries to the rest of the world? Yeah, no, it's com- it's completely fair to ask that question. Um, so a lot of other European countries exhibited the same behavior um, when we looked at the data. It didn't all happen at once, um, but it, it has all happened in the last few years. And those tipping points were typically around 5%, but you know, not all at the same time and not the same steepness. Similarly in China, so China's now well past that tipping point and the same thing has happened there. And so what do these markets have in common where we've seen that? happen. It's that, you know, all of these markets have strong policy support. 
both on the supply side and the demand side. So, so they have fleet-wide CO2 targets that automakers have to meet, which means they have to bring EVs to market. Um, there's demand side subsidies to uh, su subsidize the purchase for the end user. And that seems to be a formula that, that is working. It works in Europe, it works in, in China. And I think there's every reason to believe now that it's going to work in the U.S. as well, which was the point of the article, because the, the U.S. has now reached that tipping point, too. Right. So that has huge implications, of course, for the auto industry. I think it's interesting to note that some companies, Ford, Renault, are kind of breaking apart the part of the company that makes fossil fueled cars and breaking apart the, another part of the company that makes electric cars because investors value that uh, more more richly. So uh, do the, does industry dispute these terms or are they kind of saying like oh we see the writing on the wall we better you know restructure ourselves to to be positioned for this there's definitely a virtuous cycle going on one of the things that's an absolutely critical factor for that tipping point to take off is that the models have to be available you need to have a wide choice of vehicles that fit your needs whether you want to buy an suv or a pickup truck or a, a city car or, or a family van whatever it is you, you need that range of models to, to choose from, and you need automakers to be building them um, in the types of numbers that can really support the market. Um, but they also won't do that unless the market's there and, and the uh, and the policies in place. So I, I think it's all about creating that policy environment where there's confidence for the automakers to invest. And you're seeing, you know, recently we saw Ford come forward with its $50 billion EV plan, which really just gives me a lot of confidence that, you know, we are going to see that mass market adoption in, in the US in the next few years. Right. So consumer choice of models has been a big deal. You know, uh, the high end Porsche, et cetera, all the way down to, you know, economy models, Kia, et cetera. But in the U.S., the Inflation Reduction Act contains a provision insisted on by Senator Joe Manchin that only EVs with a specific percentage of American sourced battery metals will be eligible for the $7,500 tax credit. Now, the automakers are saying a lot of our cars won't qualify yet for this. So how do you imagine this provision will affect the cost and um, you know the consumer choice that you're talking about that's so important to, to move forward? I'd first take a step back and say, I think where US policy is now, as of the time we're recording with the Inflation Reduction Act pretty much in place, is really positive for EVs because we have the new CAFE standards from earlier in the year. And they, you know, by our analysis, they essentially require EVs to hit about 25% market share by the middle of this decade, so next three or four years. And so you have that, that pull now on the policy side um, in terms of the supply. And then what the new tax credits in the IRA will do is, again, subsidize the demand side. Um, and don't forget, a lot of the, well, the the biggest makers of electric vehicles had already exhausted their tax credit, so they were they were going to come down to zero tax credit. So even if right. they can't get the full seventy five hundred under the new regime, it's still upside for them. But you're right, the, the the battery materials provision is really interesting, and you know our view on it is the actual provision of the raw material. Um, there's plenty of supply from countries that have free trade agreements with the U.S. Mm -hmm. So you and those, could, you could those meet, qualify. Yep, mm -hmm. e exactly. Um, the, the challenge is the refining. Now, a lot of the refining happens in other countries like China and so on. So I, th I think there's going to be this, um, uh, this maybe not a reckoning, but at least a reevaluation of those supply chains. Um, and you could, in fact, see um, you know, refining capacity being built in different countries, whether the US or other you know, third countries with a free trade agreement. And that's kind of what the administration, I think, is hoping to achieve, is to see a you know, realignment of supply chains to create more value um, in, in the US. So you think that the overall the IRA is is positive for electric vehicles? Are there any obstacles to mass adoption that you see out there around the world? So we think a lot about housing stock and the physical infrastructure of countries. I think it's clear that countries which have many detached homes, standalone homes with driveways and garages, are, are, are well suited to, to home charging, which is after all the cheapest char you know type of charging. Um, in countries with a lot of high-rise living or shared car parks or very dense urban areas where you only park on the street, that's just going to be more challenging. And so th there's going to be a higher need for public infrastructure or getting agreement around building charge points in housing developments, wh which just takes more time. And these are barriers that are surmountable. Um, but I think that it's clear that you, you get faster uptake in markets where the charging installation is easy. And especially if there are a lot of two-car households where you know, EV adoption really is a no-brainer if you're a two-car household with a driveway. And, and actually, I think the U.S. is um, is one of those markets where that can be um, a, a really good driver. Other markets, less so. 
And then I would also say, I mean, when I think more broadly about global EV adoption, I think there's a very clear trend of market prioritization from the automakers because some markets are just less attractive for OEMs to sell EVs into. So if you think about uh, Europe and the US, these are large developed markets with high purchasing power. So when those regions put in place policies that support electric vehicles, the automakers have a good reason to invest in electric vehicle production and di direct that production into those end markets because those are attractive, high value markets. But for smaller economies and particularly you know, emerging countries with lower purchasing power, it's harder for them because they, you know, even if they put in place EV incentives, it may be that automakers just don't prioritize production into those countries because they're not as big. Um, they don't command as much importance uh, in the portfolio that that automaker is, is worried about. And they'll prioritize their production into other markets, which are, um, which are high value. And this is, I think this is an issue that is going to get more and more attention because we're starting to see this gap to emerging markets where you know, the emerging markets are not approaching those tipping points yet. And I think that's something that's going to get more and more focus. And is it possible that vehicle sales outgrows charging infrastructure, that there's just not enough? There's always this, this sort of balance of having enough chargers, but not and putting them where people want them and, and not too many. So people see a bunch of empty EV chargers like, oh, no one's using that. You know, of course, all, all costs money. Who pays for that? Yeah, the, I mean, there's this amazing kind of Goldilocks situation with charging because from the charging investors' point of view, they want to see really high utilization um, because that means that you know they're making money. And from an EV user's point of view, you want to see really low utilization. You want to drive into um, you know Starbucks and see five empty chargers that that are all working and ready for you, right? So right, there's this right. Goldilocks <laughs> with kind of where's where's the right um, the right uh, amount of infrastructure. Um, so we actually looked recently at these ratios of how many EVs there are per public charge point in different countries. And right now, there's a huge range. Some countries, um, there's five EVs um, per public charge point, and some it's 35 EVs per public wow. charge point. So there's a huge <laughs> different range. And it turns out there isn't really a right answer because of what I talked about before in terms of the differences of housing stock um, and the differences in you know mix of how many pure electric versus plug-in hybrids there are in a country, you, you actually end up just with this very different mix of infrastructure. And so I, I think in a way, the industry is going through this kind of suck it and see process of kind of feeling their way towards what works, while at the same time trying to ramp up very quickly, because what we know is the EVs are going to grow very quickly. Um, so you, you don't want to get too far ahead of the curve, but you definitely don't want to fall behind either. And it sounds like suburban communities may be uh, those where this can take off uh, most quickly because, as you say, there's a driveway, charger, et cetera, um, rather than urban areas where, where you know, if you live in an apartment building, well, who pays for the electricity? You got metering, tangles, all that sort of thing. Um, when, so density. So it's the, it's the less urban areas which are going to see more uh, EV adoptions, what it sounds like you're saying. And, and I think especially... Um, folks who drive every day like if you have to commute by car because you know if you live in an urban environment and you're commuting by by public transit you don't really like like the, the upfront cost of an ev you know you're 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 offsetting that upfront cost by very very low running costs so i think if you're commuting every day you're in a suburban area driving 10 miles to work 20 miles to work um that's the sweet spot really and another interesting finding from our team uh, recently is that um this is this is Norway, so people always dismiss Nor Norwegian examples. But anyway, uh, they found recently that EVs are getting more miles driven now than combustion vehicles, and so this is a, a combination of factors. But one of them you can imagine is two car households um, where they have one EV, they just drive the EV all the time because it's cheaper to run, it's clean. Um, and so it's more the fun. engine it's never just, gets used. It's, yeah, it's just right, more fun. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and we're talking about tipping points in electric cars around five percent. It's happened in several markets. It seems to be happening in the United States. Auto companies are, are on board. Uh, and Bloomberg NEF did a, re a report recently on peak car. There's a scenario that there's about a what billion uh, two cars now going to about 1.5 billion in in 2039, and the, your group uh, expects worldwide annual sales to peak in 2036, just 14 years from now, ending more than a century of growth. That's pretty. Is that good news for the climate? What does that mean? Well, 
we, we know for sure that fewer miles traveled makes the climate challenge easier because whatever, however many miles, um, passenger kilometers travel that you've got to deliver into the economy in 2050, that's how much electric vehicle capacity you're going to need. So if you can reduce the amount of, of, of passenger kilometers traveled by even just by a few percent, that's avoiding a, a, a load of emissions out to 2050. It's avoiding a load of battery man manufacturing you're going to need. It's avoiding a, a lot of mm -hmm. raw materials you need to extract from the ground. So that's really, really important. Where the peak car um, conclusion comes from is from our analysis of several trends. One is you know demographic and you know, urbanization trends in the way that we live. And an another is actually in modal shift and, and the rise of shared mobility. So this is about more folks moving over to public transit, um, more folks moving over to, over to active mobility um, and shared rides and so on. And autonomous is part of that because you can imagine uh, more robo taxi rides, meaning less need for car ownership. And so when you put all of those factors together into the model, what we find is that you, you aren't you aren't in a world where the number of the cars on the road is, is forever rising. You do reach um, you do reach a peak, um, and it may not be that far away. You know, as you say, it may be less than a couple of decades away. Right. Though I have to remember that you know Uber and Lyft initially started on reducing car ownership. It may have done that, but it doesn't reduce vehicle miles traveled because that one car uh, uh, is used by a lot of people and driving around a lot of the day. Uh, and studies in San Francisco and elsewhere have shown that uh, ride hailing services actually increase congestion, slow down travel times. Uh, so the you know what Silicon Valley sold us on uh, at least as a mobile you know eco friendly solution didn't um, play out. Um, how, how critical is driving down the cost curve to reaching a tipping point, and how important are subsidies and other strategies to drive down the cost to reach these tipping points that we're talking about in autos and other other areas? So any of these tipping points, and we could talk about other industries as well, but I think any. Any tipping point happens um, because consumers see a product that comes to market that's become affordable, um, it's desirable, it's it's ready, it's readily available to buy, and 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 most importantly, at the tipping point is that you can see that lots of other people are buying them. And that's that's what happens. That's that's what drives the tipping point because we all we all, we adopt things because our neighbor Joe is is adopting it and he loves it. And, and this is exactly what we see with EVs now. Policy. Uh, is what makes all of that possible. So consumers exist within this market construct, within a social environment uh, that influences their decisions, but it's policy that creates that market construct. So the policy is what needs to make sure that the, the products are brought to market to, to make sure that they're brought down in cost and uh, make sure they're affordable by, you know, I, I think subsidies is an important part of that. I don't think, by the way, I don't think policies may, have made EVs desirable. I think the market did that. I think some very clever and innovative companies did that. So, you know, policy can't do it all on its own. Um, but I think I think that the lesson learned here is that once you have the right policy environment in place, the social and the consumer drivers kick in and then the market starts to deliver. Right. I think you're 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 saying Tesla without saying Tesla. I mean, Tesla really disrupted the global uh, auto market and did things that no incumbent automaker would do. And I think it's helpful to remember that Tesla might not be here with if it weren't for a, you know, a U.S. federal loan guarantees and some federal help uh, in the early days. Tesla was very close to death and had a helping hand from the government to get to where it is. Though sometimes the company doesn't always acknowledge that or cut likes to, you know, airbrush that <laughs> True. in in the past. Um, but this question you know, we're talking about subsidies are important, so the markets, you know, electric cars are are taking off because they're just better. They're more fun to drive. They're cheaper to operate. They're they're more uh, efficient, et cetera, in all sorts of ways. Policy didn't do that. Policy helped it. Um, but there there were and continue to be subsidies. And, you know, let's talk about those subsidies because when do those get taken away? If, if we're at a tipping point, um, does the auto industry still need policy support? I do think that's where this all ends up. Um, and I think we've seen it in China over a period of the last five years. They've, they've phased down the subsidies and that's going to happen in, in, in markets around the world. We've seen it in renewables. Um, once renewables became cost competitive, it was no longer necessary to subsidize them. And does industry uh, do that? Because once industry is going to get, you know, they they don't like to give away those, you know, <laughs> free subsidies, right? Do they willingly let go and say, because that's a big criticism made of the oil industry. It's like, oh, 100 years, you're still getting subsidized. You know, do they let go of, of the subsidies when it's when it's mature? 
Um, it's it's never fun having having sugar removed from your diet, right? I mean, <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, but I th- I think that you still need to have the, the very clear um, policy and regulation that that um, pushes the supply side to keep supplying those vehicles, and the automakers can then set their own pricing strategies. They need to go and compete on building the best product, sourcing the cheapest materials or the best materials. But but the but the regulation is clear. You, know, that you need to meet this fuel economy standard, this CO two emission standard, this percentage EVs by twenty thirty by twenty thirty five. It's just that the subsidies become less and less important as the market grows and as the cost of the technology comes down. And you, as you phase that out, um, it just becomes a lot ne- less necessary. Is offshore wind in Europe an example? In the nineteen nineties, European governments like Denmark and Britain ordered utilities to buy offshore wind, you know, at high prices and pass that cost on to consumers. Those consumers kind of created a public good. That didn't happen in the US, but you know, did did the offshore wind industry then sort of, you know, wean itself off of the subsidies? Is is that potentially a model? Yeah, that's exactly right. The offshore wind industry, um, onshore wind and, and solar PV are all examples of this, where we started out with a, a subsidy driven model where it was the government had to fill the, 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 the gap in the business model um, by providing money to make up the difference in costs. And over time, as those industries scaled up, they drove costs out of the equation to the point where they became, uh, first of all, you know, broadly cost competitive with fossil fuels, but then even undercut them now um, to the point where you know, today they're cheaper than fossil fuels in uh, most markets around the world. And, and so you just, you just uh, over time, you remove those subsidies um, because you just don't need them anymore. And I think the same thing will happen ultimately with electric vehicles. So we are at a tipping point for EVs and there's policy support in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, we've talked about some of the supply chain constraints. There's also inflation um, is a big issue here. This, this uh, recent U.S. bill uh, in the United States is called the Inflation Reduction Act. And yet I read that lithium carbonate prices, a key ingredient in lithium ion batteries, have risen from $5,000 per ton about two years ago to $70,000 per ton, more than 10x, according to a BNF report by your co- colleague, head of metals and mining. So how vulnerable are EVs and other clean energy products to you know, price surges and um, when they become more popular? This is definitely one of the key issues. If, if we look out over the next two to five years, um, the supply and demand of, of critical materials for, for EV batteries is absolutely a key issue. And we have seen those prices rise over the last couple of years. But one thing to note is that a lot of those materials have come down from the peaks of a few months ago. So the last three or four months, we have seen them recede a little bit, which is a good sign. But I don't want to minimize that because from our point of view, supply and demand of the critical materials like lithium, like nickel, like cobalt are very finely balanced over a kind of three to five year horizon. Uh, We do need to see more investment in capacity to bring those materials to market. Um, It's not a reserve problem. There's plenty of it in the ground. Uh, we think there's enough for, for, for decades to come, but um, we need to see the investment in the mining capacity and the refining capacity to bring it to market. And that's what high prices do for you, is they deliver that investment signal to the miners, to the investors, to give them the confidence to go ahead and invest. And, and, and we think that's what we're seeing now, um, but we need to see more of it. Coming up, what needs to happen for technology to help us decarbonize our economy? I am a great believer in technological innovation. And I I do believe that technology can help us achieve net zero globally, but we've got to have the right policies in place. We'll be right back. Billions of people in Asia, Africa, and Latin America can't afford a car at all, let alone an EV. In India, for example, 430,000 electric vehicles were sold during a recent 12-month period but only 18,000 of them were cars. The rest, two and three wheelers. Before we get back to our conversation with Albert Chung about clean tech tipping points, Climate One producer Austin Cologne brings us into the world of electric micromobility, EVs that aren't cars, which are transforming the way people travel in urban areas, not just in the global south, also here in the U.S. E-bikes, e-scooters, e-mopeds, They're all the rage here at the Electrify Expo in Long Island, New York. These vehicles are often categorized under the umbrella term micromobility. So what exactly is micromobility? Yeah, micromobility, to put it concisely, is lightweight electric vehicles. That's Chase Stubblefield, 
Managing Director of Electric Scooter Guide. Obviously, the things like the bike actually predate the car, and even the electric bike is 100 years old. Micromobility is a quickly growing facet of urban life. Who wants to drive in traffic, then pay through the nose for parking if you can even find a spot? But how could these new vehicles change a real New Yorker's daily commute? So I bike home from Manhattan into Brooklyn and I take the, the Williamsburg Bridge. And sometimes even with like a pedal assist, you know, pedaling up, it's annoying. You know, it'd be nice just to have like a throttle. You could just cruise up over the bridge. That's Jesse Egner, an artist who lives in Brooklyn and a city bike enthusiast. He's here at the Electrify Expo to check out what else is on the market that could potentially replace the public city bikes for work commutes or just to get around the city. I would need something that is, you know, light enough that I could carry up and down stairs if I need to, but I also want something that's going to have good battery power. I know for a fact, like, I would not ride, I would not commute to work on a bike if it wasn't an e-bike. But where the train isn't a good option, can this technology disrupt our car-centric culture? 50% of all U.S. car trips are under three miles. And that's something to repeat over and over. This is a stat that should just be written everywhere, shared everywhere. So if the majority of trips are short, and it gets even shorter when you go to an urban context, and then when you go globally, it gets even shorter than that. A lot of people who have micromobility today, they supplement it with their car, and they're just like, well, I save all of this gas, and it's actually faster. This is Chase Doublefield again. It's so interesting that every inch of really everything related to the car is subsidized. It has everything going for it over 100 years, and yet still there's so much organic momentum behind micromobility that it's just... You know, even without the regulation, without the, the space, without a, a medium speed lane or much low speed lanes, you know, it's still thriving and, you know, growing 10x constantly. 10x. That's far faster than electric cars. So what does the future of travel look like when you include these lightweight electric vehicles? I think transit's going to grow dramatically as micromobility grows. A lot of commutes into the city will probably start to look like micromobility, then transit, then micromobility, or micromobility, then car, then micromobility. As someone who lives in a city myself, it is exciting to imagine a future where people can get around quickly on zero emission vehicles. For Climate One, I'm Austin Colon. I was in New York recently and bike shares and e-bikes are everywhere. There seem to be more every time I go. It's exciting to see so many commuters and tourists bopping around the city and weaving through slow moving car traffic. Now let's get back to our conversation with Albert Chung. Earlier this year, the financial giant BlackRock issued a report titled, Three Reasons Clean Energy is at a Tipping Point. Those reasons are, renewables are cheaper, they are less susceptible to geopolitical turmoil, and demand for them is growing. I asked Albert if he agrees. I would go further. I, I would say that um, renewables have, have passed the tipping point. I think, they're, I think they are the dominant force in, in the power system today, not in terms of the installed base. So I, I think, uh, you know, in total at the moment, wind and solar are only, only about 10% of global electricity production. Um, but that's a hu you know, huge step forward from where they were 10 years ago. Um, and, and there are now, I think, 10 countries that get more than a quarter of their power from wind and solar. So that, that's already impressive. But what I'm really talking about is the annual installs. So if you look at all of the power capacity that's added each year, um, about two thirds of it is wind or solar. Um, about 80% of it is, is clean, is renewables. Um, so if, if you add in hydro, geothermal, things like that, it's 80%. So, um, you know, EVs at 5% at in the US, renewables at 80% globally. So I think we're well past the tipping point. So let's look at other sectors, you know, whether it's, you know, heat pumps, uh, grid scale batteries. What are other tipping points, positive tipping points out there technologically? I would love to see a revolution, a tipping point around heat pumps. Um, <laughs> they are the most obvious solution for, for really a large chunk of the building heat energy market. Um, and we are seeing growth, particularly in Europe, where there's more policy support in place now. Um, we're seeing acceleration in heat pump uh, deployments. But we are I, I don't think we're at the stage where we can call it a tipping point yet. And the reason for that is the cost is still too high. Um, we, need, we need the cost to come down um, or we need policy to, to, to support that. The installers, frankly, the contractors, the building contractors and the, the heating engineers are still learning about the technology. They're still learning how to install it and how to up, upgrade the building envelope to, to adopt heat pumps. 
Um, and most of the consumers who are, who are adopting this technology today are still those climate conscious innovators who are willing to go through the kind of nuts and bolts of figuring out how it's all going to work and the kinks in the installation process. So it's definitely not the mass market yet. But I hope we'll get there. You know, if we if we can get those costs down, get the training done for those installers, I think we can get to a tipping point in heat pumps um, over the next few years. Right, and we should clarify that heat pumps also cool. They're they're not what they're not very well named. The, um, I'm putting some in my house, and they they heat and cool. Other areas where um, is it grid scale batteries? You know, v, you know, vehicle to X or vehicle to home. You know, we're hearing about that as uh, using your car as a battery for your home when the power goes out, et cetera. What are, what are, so if heat pumps number one, what other areas would there be some technological tipping points? Yeah, large scale batteries for sure. Um, and, you know, I should have said this one before heat pumps because I think it's further ahead. I think building off the success of electric vehicles, we're seeing uh, such cheap uh, battery technology, notwithstanding the inflation we're seeing this year. But uh, on utility scale storage, we're expecting that market to roughly triple um, over the course of the next eight years or so. Um, and they're, they're doing they're going to do that on the basis of being an economic solution, uh, being a competitive solution for managing variability um, and managing flexibility on the grid. Um, so I think that's really exciting. It's funny you mentioned vehicle to vehicle to X or vehicle to grid. This idea of using the electric vehicle battery as storage because the potential there is just huge. Um, when, when we look at the numbers out to 2030, um, the amount of battery capacity deployed inside electric vehicles is going to be somewhere around eight to 10 times more than the amount deployed as stationary installations on the grid. Mm -hmm. So so it wouldn't take a lot. You wouldn't need every car. You know, if even, even if you could get one in 10 cars to participate, you might be doubling the amount of grid storage available. So, I, you know, the potential there is huge. Right. And uh, so mobile power plants and and uh, the electric utility executives are really excited about that. There's some issues to, and I think the V to H is a lot more vehicle to home is a lot more promising because I'll let access my battery for my home. Whereas the people have been reluctant, owners of electric cars have been reluctant to let the grid, you know, cycle their battery um, and, you know, use which over time kind of reduces, you know, the range and resale value of that car. They've been reluctant to do it for, for the grid, but people might be more reluctant to do it for yeah. themselves. I'll just talk about one other, actually, one other industry is, uh, or, or sector is, is hydrogen. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we, we, don't pro we didn't project hydrogen approaching economic competitiveness really until around 2030. But now we've seen so many commitments from different countries to build out hydrogen infrastructure, to, to, to build electrolyzers. That's going to drive the cost down quickly. But in addition to that, because of the very high natural gas prices right now in Europe and, and in Asia, um, we're, we're just temporarily in this environment where green hydrogen um, is actually cost competitive with natural gas. Now, it's it's a bit of a theoretical exercise because there, you know, there's not a lot of green hydrogen actually being produced today. So it's kind of a spreadsheet comparison rather than a, a real projects out there. But that's only going to accelerate that industry. So the, you know, the tipping point for hydrogen may not be today, but it does feel like it's coming. Hmm. Yeah, I'll admit that I used to be a hydrogen skeptic for quite some time, and I'm kind of softening on hydrogen as I see green hydrogen and and a little more not for passenger vehicles, but certainly for for long haul and for for um, and we should you know m mention that green hydrogen is using renewables uh, to uh, split water. So Albert, we've been talking about tipping points as if the arc of history always bends toward progress. And once the tipping points are reached, by definition, you kind of don't go backwards. Are you a techno optimist? Do you think that we can, looking at all this, do you think that do you feel better about the carbon challenge? I wouldn't call myself a techno optimist because I, I think that implies that we can sit back and let the technology do the work. Mm -hmm. But I am a great believer in technological innovation, and I, I, I do believe the technology can. Um, uh, help us achieve net zero globally, um, but we've got to have the right policies in place um, and we've got to have the right education so people kind of understand um, how to adopt these technologies. And, you know, it's it, you can't just think about technology in a vacuum. Right. And, I, you know, I, I said that uh, tipping points are by definition can't go backwards, but I think of an example where, um, you know, 
incandescent light bulbs were basically the same since the era of Thomas Edison for what you know nearly a hundred years, and there was a move toward you know a better you know LEDs etc that are that are, provide better light, more, less heat, more efficient, and yet still there was a big push to claw that back and and sort of hold on to that incandescent light bulb of of Thomas Edison's era in the United States. So, you know, can tipping points be undone? Can empires kind of, you know, strike back? <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting question. We've not seen it yet in the main kind of uh, energy transition technologies that we're tracking. We, we haven't mm-hmm. really seen that at all. And where we have, it's been from folks who have a lot to gain from, you know, pushing back on on, on, on the new thing. Um, from the, uh, the, the manufacturers of the, the old technology trying it, to hang on yeah, to it. The, the incumbents, really, who have mm-hmm. heavy investments in other technologies and don't, don't want to see the new thing come along. Um, and I think it's up to us as society to be wise to that and make sure that um, if, if there is pushback, it's coming from an honest place rather than a place of kind of um, uh, particular kind of uh, benefits to certain um, companies or certain sectors, for example. Which is where the incumbents, oil and fossils, you know, they have, they're politically entrenched. So, you know, if, if the markets were, quote, as free as we think they are, it sounds like EVs and uh, renewable electricity would win. But that's not the case, right? I, I think that, um, uh, t- to me, I see some uh, really uh, structural differences between the energy transition in, in Europe and the energy transition in the U.S., Um, Mm. uh, and the reaction to the energy crisis as well is different. And I think one of the real underpinning differences is that Europe's oil and gas industry's best days are already behind it. Um, You know, a lot of the reserves are are uh, exhausted. A lot of those companies are already trying to pivot away. Um, Whereas if you look at the U.S., there's still great reserves, very competitive um, re- reserves um, if they were to be exploited. And, and so I think you, it's, it's a fundamental difference where, uh, you know, on, on both sides, where the energy transition is a threat to an industry that still sees opportunity in front of it. And, and secondly, the energy crisis, when we look at very high oil prices, very high gas prices, is an opportunity in the U.S. economy for U.S. corporations in a way that it isn't for Europe, where it's mostly a pure threat. For Europe, so I think if you you can call it fossil fuel lobbying, um, you can call it kind of influence on government and influence on on the on the legislative process, but it's also a fundamental fact that those are industries that are that are stronger, and in principle had a brighter future. Uh, you know, if if climate change were not an issue in the U.S., whereas in Europe those those days are already behind us and would have been behind us anyway. Coming up. How can we get investors to choose clean technology over oil and gas? If we can accelerate electric vehicles, accelerate renewables, that will reduce demand for gas and coal and oil. And, and then investors will just invest less in, in, those, in those commodities. That, that's my theory of change. We'll be right back. With Russia's weaponization of oil and gas during its invasion of Ukraine, Moving away from fossil fuels has taken on new urgency in Europe. But is Europe really going to be able to meet its goal of accelerating its transition away from fossil fuels? And what happens when winter sets in and Russia cuts off supply? From a policy standpoint, the position is extremely clear. Um, Europe wants to accelerate the transition to clean energy as a means of removing its dependence on Russian gas. So that means more renewables more heat pumps, which we've talked about, more clean hydrogen, um, also more bioenergy. And so the the Repower EU plan, which is the the European Commission's plan to get off Russian gas, calls for more of all of those clean energy technologies. Uh, It also means importing natural gas from other providers that aren't Russia, like the Mm -hmm. US and Mm -hmm. and other neighboring countries. Um, But I I think we can be clear, you know, investments in clean energy our investments in energy security, and that, that's clearly 100% aligned um, in the minds of European policymakers. I, I, th- I think with that said, I think there is this back to fossil fuels narrative that goes around. And I think there's a couple of things to be said around that. Um, one is that um, over the last few years, we've seen gas power generation displacing coal in Europe as carbon prices have risen and forced coal out of the market, essentially, and that's good for emissions. Now, because gas prices are extremely high, coal has become more competitive. So coal's making a bit of a comeback. 
And so I think that's driving a bit of this. Are we are we kind of reneging on the energy transition? I think that narrative is coming a little bit from here. But I think we should remember that this is a short term issue, and power generation is part of the EU carbon market. Um, and that carbon market is being tightened to meet more stringent climate goals for 2030. So I, I don't think this is a long term thing. I think the carbon market is still going to drive um, emissions out of the power sector, even if there's some sort of speed bumps along the way. In, in Russia's invasion, the world saw how nuclear power plants were at risk. Just recently, Ukraine said Russian shelling damaged the Zoporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe, risking fire and radiation leaks. You know, how much does this factor into the calculus about nuclear as part of the carbon free pathway? Because nuclear has seen support, uh, still seeing policy support. Does that raise questions about nuclear's part of the mix? I think attitudes to nuclear in Europe are, are shifting a little bit at the moment. If you rewind just a few months, um, at the beginning of the war, Germany was saying, we're going to do everything we can to limit our gas consumption this year, um, everything within our power. And folks would say, okay, what about keeping some nuclear on? And they said, not that. <laughs> we'll do everything else, but not that. But recently, um, you know, we've heard uh, the environment minister in Germany saying, maybe we can see a way to keeping you know one or two of these plants online um which really for the last decade that was never on the table so ever since it, fukushima ever since germany fukushima. Was, yeah, exactly right. so we're, we're just starting to see a glimmer of that um uh in germany but at the same time right now we are we're, we're facing a, a challenge in europe because the nuclear reactors in france um, a lot of them are um are, are out of commission right now because of maintenance issues and so um, there's this kind of fear as well that um, that nuclear is actually not going to deliver this winter when we need it most. Um, so, so it's really a, it's a complex, you know, there's kind of points on, on either side of the ledger right now for nuclear. So I, I think time will tell which way that conversation really goes. We recently spoke with Roman Zinchenko, co-founder of a green tech incubator in Ukraine. He said that with the shutdown of heavy in industry due to the war, Ukraine is exporting electricity to countries in their west. They're now connected into the European countries, no longer to the Russian grid. Um, you know, how is more broadly, how is Russia's invasion restructuring the interdependence of energy flows within Western Europe? Um. We don't fully know yet. I think we're going to find out this winter. There's been this um, mm -hmm. huge trend over the last couple of decades to have more interlinkages between different European nations and their energy markets, both particularly for power, but also for gas. And that would allow countries to tap into each, each other's resources. For example, when the wind's not blowing in one country, you can bring in the hydro from, from somewhere else, bring in the nuclear from somewhere else, et cetera. And, and we, you know, our analyst team, we've always had this question in the back of our minds, which was, what would really happen to that interconnected system, that interdependence, if the going got really tough? Like, could a European country really rely on its neighbors in a critical situation to keep the lights on? And I think I think Putin's Russia is really hoping that the answer is no. Um, that is their gambit: is that they want to they're trying to pressure uh, Europe using the natural gas weapon and see if that, that solidarity can crumble to see if we can chip away at that notion of a united Europe. Um, so I think um, I think this winter is the test of that. We're, like one side is going to win. And uh, I think there's every chance it could it can be Europe if we can really get across our, our demand side management across, you know, in, in the UK, across Europe. I think it could be it could be the time when we really show that that, that natural gas weapon didn't work. Um, the other issue uh, where there's this ba back to fossil fuels fear is around European countries building out more natural gas import capacity mm -hmm. um, and also encouraging you know, the US suppliers to build out more export capacity for, natural, uh, for, for, for LNG. Um, now, all of these terminals that are going to be built need some form of long-term investment case to underpin that investment decision. And that's quite a hard story to tell uh, to the investors if if Europe is going to undergo a rapid clean energy transition, then you know what's the role of these gas import terminals in ten years' time? Say, um, so now we have these discussions about how do you future-proof those gas investments? How do you make them hydrogen-ready, for example? Um, 
but we I don't think we yet really know exactly what hydrogen ready means. So this is, you know, that does get quite complicated. But in a way, I think I think the, the renewables and clean energy piece is the is the clearest piece and actually the, what to do about the gas infrastructure piece is the most complex. Right, because it seems to be really unclear right now if, if these high prices are going to accelerate the switch. You know, high gas prices makes EVs more more economic, uh, but it also makes investment in oil and gas, you know, more more um, more economic. And we're, we've seen record uh, profits from the uh, oil and gas companies in, in recent quarters. So is there demand destruction that's happening or is there you know, expansion of supply or both? Do we know yet? I, I think I think we should always focus on demand. Um, what, you know, when I think my 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 kind of um, model of change in my mind for the energy transition is to is that we need to be um, removing demand for fossil fuels, and actually the supply side matters less because the the job of of the of the oil and gas companies, the job of investors in in energy, is to invest just the right amount in supply so that you can make a return on whatever you think demand is going to be. So if we can if we can um, accelerate electric vehicles, accelerate renewables. Um, that will reduce demand for gas and coal and oil, and and then investors will just invest less in in those in those commodities. That that's my theory of change. I I think that I think that there can be over worry about high oil prices driving investment in oil um, in oil production. People can stress too much about that from a climate perspective. I, I actually think that's a slight red herring. Because really, what happened? What matters is: Are you going to burn that oil or not? And if, if we can get electric vehicles on the road, then we're not going to burn the oil. Yeah, uh, I can hear your economist talking because you know so many uh, uh, activists focus much more on the supply side: attack supply, villainize supply, stop supply. You know, keep it in the ground, don't build that new terminal, um, and less on on the demand side. Um, so the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which you've been covering, you know, how big a deal is this and how big an impact do you think it will have on the demand side that you say we ought to be focusing on? Um, so our, um, our U.S. team has been poring over the, the Inflation Reduction Act, and we've been talking about it a lot and writing about it a lot the last couple of weeks. Um, it's a really big deal. It's the biggest climate and clean energy package um, the U.S. has ever passed. Um, I think they're saying $370 billion of climate and clean energy provisions. Um, it tackles all of the major moving parts of the clean energy transition. It tackles uh, renewables, energy storage, electric vehicles, hydrogen, carbon capture, uh, methane, uh, even nuclear. Uh, uh, I'm, I may be forgetting one or two other areas. Um, and it throws decent amounts of money at, at all of them. Um, so I, I, we, we think it's a big deal. We think it will accelerate the energy transition. Um, you know, I'll just take one example. You know, the, the hydrogen tax credit is worth um, about three dollars per kilogram, I believe, at the maximum level if you meet all of the different requirements. Um, if I'm not wrong, um, and uh, you know, even uh, you know, by, by our analysis in a lot of markets around the world, green hydrogen will only cost somewhere around one to two dollars per kilogram by 2030. So three dollars makes a huge, huge difference. So that's just that's just one example. So I feel very, very optimistic about the impacts of it. Um, is it perfect? No. Um, it doesn't put in place any any uh, clear targets. It doesn't. Um, there's no um, there's no kind of clear uh, uh, standards in terms of how much of these technologies we need to adopt and things like that. But you have to look at it in the context of um, what the states are doing where you have some of those targets in place that's going to pull through demand. Um, and then the money coming from the, from the Inflation Reduction Act really making it easier to meet those targets. So as someone who's based in Europe, following the U.S., um, what was your reaction when you saw that the U.S. Congress is poised to, to pass this bill? How did you feel about it? Did it how did it land with you personally? I know you're, you're an economist, so you don't have feelings, but but yeah, you know, or you're not supposed to, but <laughs> you do. But you don't. <laughs> I, I wrote a piece in January about the biggest risks to the energy transition in 2022, and I wrote about inflation. I wrote about rising financing costs. I wrote about recession. Um, but I finished the piece by saying the biggest risk to the global energy transition would be if countries, especially the U.S., come back from COP26 and fail to pass the policies needed to meet the pledges that they've made in Glasgow. And I said that if 
that happens, and particularly if that happens in the US, that will really undermine the process going into COP27. It would really remove pressure on anyone who's thinking about not um, raising their commitments and so on and so forth. So my reaction was, um, this was, uh, you know, on a global level, um, you know, probably the most important thing that could have happened this year to keep the energy transition somewhat on track. Albert Chung is head of analysis at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Bloomberg NEF, based in London. Albert, it's always a pleasure to have you and your insights on the show. Thanks for coming back. Thank you for having me. On this Climate One, we've been talking about reaching a tipping point for widespread adoption of EVs and other clean technology. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard. Sometimes it's depressing, difficult, complicated, and often exciting. It's also critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help people have their own deeper, empowering climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Megan Basili is our production manager. Our team also includes consulting producer Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.